Obama resigned his Senate seat after winning the presidential election. As governor, Blagojevich has sole authority to name a replacement. Gibbs says Obama believes the Illinois legislature should consider holding a special election to fill the Senate seat. That's something uh, other Illinois lawmakers have also been calling for. But I want to move as quickly as possible to let the people of Illinois be represented in the United States Senate by a replacement to Barack uh, who can work effectively. The U.S. Attorney's Office says there's no indication that Obama knew about Blagojevich's alleged scheming. On last night's show, we highlighted the plight and the fight of the employees of Republic Windows and Doors on Chicago's north side. After Bank of America cut off financing for their employer, the employees were given just three days' notice last week that they'd be out of a job, no severance, no vacation pay, no nothing by the end of the week. The workers' union picketed in front of the bank in Chicago on Wednesday to no avail. The factory closed on Friday, and the workers refused to leave. They've essentially been sitting in at the factory for the past five days, trying to get what they think they are owed. Indeed, the Federal Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act seems to indicate that companies have to give employees 60 days' notice before closing plants or laying all their workers off. The, reperker, the, the workers at Republic got three days. Um, Bank of America, for its part, says it does not have control over whether or not the company pays its workers. The politicians weighing in on the side of the workers, they've said, hey, that may be true, but weren't those 25 billion taxpayer dollars that just went to B of A supposed to facilitate, I don't know, loans to American businesses who need them? We have contacted all of our agencies across state government, uh, and as of now, uh, every agency has been ordered to uh, suspend doing any business with the Bank of America. The Bank of America received $25 billion in taxpayer money as part of the financial bailout. This is exactly and precisely the kind of thing that uh, isn't right when, uh, on the one hand, uh, powerful special interests get the help of taxpayer money to bail them out, the banks, and yet the purpose of that money was supposed to be to provide a line of credit to businesses like this to keep workers working and keep people employed. And yet the Bank of America has yet to step up and say that they're going to be helpful to this company and keep these workers working. So unless and until they do that, we, the state of Illinois, will suspend doing any business with the Bank of, uh, of America. And we hope that this kind of leverage and pressure will encourage the Bank of America to do the right thing for this business, take some of that federal tax money that they've received and uh, invest it by providing uh, the necessary credit to this company so these workers can keep their jobs. Secondly, we are preparing a temporary restraining order, a TRO, and we are uh, going into court tomorrow to seek an injunction uh, by a federal judge to assure that the uh, provisions of the federal law, the Warren Act, are followed so that, um, so that uh, 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 these workers who, are facing, uh, who have faced now the loss of their jobs will at least have the opportunity to uh, get the benefits they're, they're entitled to under federal law. Severance pay, vacation days, uh, uh, all the different things that the Warren Act provides, these workers have a right to, they're entitled to. So we're going into court tomorrow to enforce that provision and get them the help they need. Uh, third, we are um, uh, also working with the Chicago Food Depository to um, see if we can get a delivery of food to the workers and their families so that uh, during this period where they're not working or in a position to be able to afford the help that they need for their families, that they can get some, some help and have some uh, food available to be able to feed themselves and their families and their children. Um, so these are the acts that we're taking now. We're going to continue to work in conjunction with uh, some of our efforts. Congressman Luis Gutierrez has been a real champion on the side of these workers, and uh, I've been in constant communication with him. And we'll continue to discuss things with him as events unfold. Uh, this 4 o'clock meeting that Carl referenced is uh, one that Congressman Gutierrez is going to be at. And he's uh, re going to report to me on the progress of that meeting. But uh, let me be very clear here. We are going to do everything possible uh, here in Illinois to side with these workers. And it isn't just lending them moral support, but it's about putting pressure on financial institutions like the Bank of America, as well as uh, making sure that we have our court system enforce the federal law so these workers uh, are get what they're entitled to uh, under their under the law and under what is the right thing to do. United States Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald arrested Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich last week to stem what he called a political crime spree which included the sale of Barack Obama's vacant Senate seat but now some attorneys are wondering 
what real evidence Fitzgerald has. So far, nothing has been disclosed to support the claim that Blagojevich uh, received anything of value in exchange for Obama's Senate seat. So did Fitzgerald act too soon? With us now, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General and partner at uh, Geneva and Tunzing LLP, Victoria Tunzing. Uh, Victoria, welcome back to the show. Um, that's almost as hard to say as Blagojevich. I'm just, you know, that's what I do all day, practice saying the thing. Um, what, um, Hannity, H-A-N-N-I-T-Y. <laughs> uh, no wonder you, I don't, the emails keep bouncing back. All right, so is there any evidence here to get him on a crime at this point? Well, we don't, we don't know that because uh, ordinarily the prosecutor doesn't tell everything that he has. But it certainly looks like this was cut short prematurely because... For all that we've heard about, and you, I think we can rest assured that we would have heard it if payments had crossed hands, this, this was cut off before anybody received anything of value. And, and although you can prosecute as an attempt or a conspiracy, it's a real hard jury appeal not to have the money actually changed hands. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, thank you very much. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. and. Uh, present my uh, closing argument and my chance to be able to talk to you, talk to the people of Illinois, and talk to anybody else who is listening. I uh, had the last uh, couple of days, I've had a chance to be able to go out and talk to as many people as I possibly could about my desire to be able to appear here before the Senate, the Senate trial, and have a chance to be able to tell the whole story, have every single witness I could possibly bring be able to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth present as much evidence as available to be able to have the whole story told and have a chance to be able to show you here in the Senate, show the people of Illinois and show anybody else who's listening that I have done absolutely nothing wrong, that I followed every law, that I never ever intended to violate any law, and that when the whole truth is heard and the whole story is told, that's ultimately what will be shown. I was hopeful that I'd have a chance to be able to do that in a Senate hearing in this trial, a chance to be able to bring witnesses in, a whole list of witnesses, every single witness in the criminal complaint. Would it be nice to have them here so they can tell the truth and tell you under oath what they know? I want to be able to bring in witnesses from Rahm Emanuel, the president's chief of staff. But what I'm absolutely certain about is that our office had no involvement in any deal making around my Senate seat. That I'm absolutely certain of. And the that is that would be a violation of everything that this campaign has been about uh, okay so here we have rod blagojevich's defense entering a subpoena for barack obama uh down here at the bottom it says according to media reports president obama was interviewed by two united states attorneys and two fbi agents for two hours and if we go down here to item number eight nine and ten it says President Obama has stated publicly that he was confident that no representatives of mine would have any part of any deals related to this seat. Yet, despite President Obama stating that no representatives of his had any part of the deal, Labor Union President told FBI and United States Attorneys and the rest is redacted, so we don't know what he said. They don't want to know, for example, Governor Bob, who our emissary is going to be. Yeah, I don't know yet. You know what? Maybe that fucking horse's ass, Harry Reid, ought to be the emissary. You know, fuck you, Harry Reid and Menendez. You guys fucking do it. What? Maybe they should be the ones. What happened? Why, why, um, why not Rom? I don't know. Let him call us. Well, but Rom, Rom, they want Jesse. They call, Rom called Harris two weeks ago and said, Obama... Here's the four Obama would like. Jesse Jr., Hines, Tammy Duckworth, and Jan Tchaikovsky. Well, we did learn from Discovery, and Discovery is a dump of information that the prosecution has gathered that, ha that is required by law to provide to the defense. We learned in reading the FBI 302 reports that I remember that we've turned, uh, we've turned all of this stuff back into uh, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, we re I read the 302 reports on Raghu Nayak and Rajinder Bedi. Those were the two men that had approached me. Raghu Nayak in, in particular was very interesting to me because he said under oath to the FBI and a U.S. attorney that he had met with Congressman Jackson early in October of 2008. 
These gentlemen approached me on October 28th and 31st of that same year. That he had had a conversation with Congressman Jackson, and Congressman Jackson was encouraging him to come talk to us about money in the Senate seat. And he believed that if he were in the Senate, because there was, you know, possibilities of Rod being, in, you know, indicted on something at some point, I think Rod lived with that daily, that he would be very close to the future president and help Rod get a pardon, which was to me one of the most absurd and many absurd things I read in those 302s. But it was very clear to me that Congressman Jackson was the man who empowered these two emissaries to come talk to us about the United States Senate seat. And it is my view that Congressman Jackson was allowed to get away with a federal crime because the U.S. attorney and the FBI knew all of this from their interviews uh, of witnesses and the people uh, in the center of this. There was one other thing that I recall from the 302s that I found very interesting. There was a, and this was out of Raghu Nayak's report, where he told uh, the agent that Congressman Jackson was concerned about the conversations that they had, and he had called Nyack, asking Nyack if he would talked to them about money. Well, he had, and he said he did, and Jackson told him, according to Nyack, don't talk about money anymore. I hear that Blagojevich is being investigated, okay? So what can I conclude logically from that is Congressman Jackson was tipped off by someone that there was an investigation going on of my brother and protected him. Now, I'm also aware of your interest in the matter of the Illinois Senate appointment. Let me say that I was as appalled and disappointed as anybody by the revelations earlier this week. I have never spoken to the governor on this subject. I am confident that no representatives of mine would have any part of any deals related to this seat. I think the materials released by the U.S. Attorney reflect that fact. I know, but I mean, he wants to be able to have some deniability on it, I guess. I know what you okay. mean. Okay. But this is what they're telling me. And so he reached out to Tom Balanoff at SEIU, and uh, Balanoff Tuesday night told me that Barack had called him Monday night, and then uh, Balanoff hustled into my office Thursday, yesterday, yesterday, you know, to talk about this, and that he really wants her. And Andy Stern and Tom were in my office Monday. I think I told you that. Mm -hmm. to get a sense of where I was. So we've done this. So Thursday, Balanoff came back with a message directly from Obama, Valerie Jarrett. Uh, I want to make sure that the next senator of Illinois is focused on health care, jobs, and all the struggles that the families of this state are going through. Here we have uh, item number 11 on the articles of impeachment for Governor Blagojevich, which states the governor's actions with regard to and responsibility for the I Save Our X program, as more fully detailed in the final report, section 4 F, and in the committee record as a whole. So, this was when uh, Rod, as governor, was going to Canada, Ireland, and the UK for cheaper medications. First of all, let me say thank you uh, for being here. I uh, am very proud of my older brother. He's always been bigger than me, stronger than me, faster than me, smarter than me, and a lot more successful than me. He's, in fact, very successful in business, makes a lot more money than me, and he happens to be a Republican. And the reason I raise that is because my brother and I get along, and it's good to see that men and women of both political parties coming together, working together on an issue that's so important to our elderly and to people all across our country. I want to thank Governor Pawlenty for his leadership. I want to thank Governor Bob Wise for his leadership. Good to see you again, Bob. I want to thank Governor Jim Doyle from Wisconsin, who's here. I'm here with governors and members of Congress of both political parties. I'm also here with Senator Byron Dorgan, our great United States Senator Dick Durbin. Thank him for being here. Congressman Gil Gutnicht, who, as a Republican, was the leader in the House on legislation that would allow consumers and states to have access to Canadian to prescription drugs reimported from Canada. Uh, and he worked together with my own congressman in Chicago, and that's Congressman Rahm Emanuel, who's also here. Uh, one more point, former 
Mayor of Springfield, Massachusetts, Michael Albano, is here. Mayor Albano, I want to make sure we acknowledge you and thank you for your leadership nationwide. Being here with governors and members of Congress from both political parties and a, another political party or two. Major political party. <laughs> major political party from Vermont to talk about a problem that confronts all of us, the rising cost of prescription drugs. Last year, my home state of Illinois spent $1.8 billion on prescription drugs. And as Illinois, like most states, grapples with historic budget deficits, we are also bracing ourselves for higher prices next year. During these difficult economic times, we are determined to keep taxes as low as we possibly can. But this is not just a budgetary problem. This is a problem that every single day affects people's lives. You've all heard the stories about senior citizens, about our elderly being forced to ask themselves questions. Questions like, should I take my diabetes medication or should I pay my rent? Should I treat my high blood pressure or should I pay my utility bill? It just isn't right. According to a study by the Commonwealth Fund, almost one in four senior citizens with chronic illnesses report that sometimes they try to save money by skipping doses of medications that they need or by not filling their prescriptions when they need to. But just a few hundred miles away, Canadian consumers are paying prices that are 30 to 40 percent, 30 to 80 percent lower than prices we pay right here in the United States for the same brand named FDA approved prescription drugs. It's wrong when Americans have to pay prices for prescription drugs that are far above those charged to consumers in Canada or for that matter anywhere else in the developed world. Today I'm proud to be here as I said with Governor Tim Pawlenty to convene these meetings. We're here to share ideas and develop new innovative solutions to the growing crisis in prescription drug prices. As governors We've done everything we possibly can to reduce our state spending on prescription drugs. We've redesigned our health plans. We've negotiated with providers for lower prices. We created a buying club in Illinois so we can pool the buying power of 1.5 million senior citizens and reduce prices by as much as 20 percent. But our fight to keep the cost of prescription drugs from overwhelming our state budgets and from bankrupting our most vulnerable citizens cannot stop at the border. Reimporting American drugs from Canada is a constructive solution to a serious and growing problem. The law already gives the federal government the ability to work with states to develop plans to safely re-import prescription drugs from Canada. In fact, in Illinois, We've developed a pilot program that contemplates working with the federal government in a way that could save our taxpayers and our consumers millions of dollars each year. That program was created after we set, sent our state special drug advocates to Canada to meet with Canadian health officials, with pharmacists, and with distributors. Our fact finders came home convinced that the Canadian drug supply is just as safe and in some cases even safer than ours here in the United States. Their report estimated that by importing prescription drugs from Canada, the state of Illinois and its consumers could save nearly $91 million. $91 million. But so far, the federal government has refused to work with us. The Food and Drug Administration claims that drugs made right here in the United States and shipped to Canada under strict regulation are not safe for Americans to use. I must confess, I can't quite understand the FDA's concerns. Despite the federal ban, over the last 10 years, millions of Americans have crossed the border to buy their prescription drugs from Canada, and every year, the FDA allows them to do it. It's either safe or it's not. They need to make up their minds. Yet there is currently no state or federal oversight of these 
pres imported prescription drugs. If safety is the real issue here, then we need to do a better job of protecting our consumers. That's why we need to develop programs like the one we proposed with stringent guidelines that will make sure that our consumers buy their medications only from legitimate, well-regulated Canadian pharmacies. If the FDA really cared about safety, that's what they would do. As governors and lawmakers, we're here to remind the powers that be at the FDA that they don't work for the big drug companies or their high-priced lobbyists. They work for the people just as we do. It's time the FDA starts listening to them. And the people on this issue have spoken very clearly. They want lower prescription drug prices. We cannot keep ignoring this problem. This is an issue that is not going away. With every passing day, more and more people are finding themselves being forced to make choices they shouldn't be forced to make, choices our neighbors in Canada don't have to make. I know it's easy here in Washington to hear the voices of the lobbyists of the big drug companies, but it's time the people in Washington start hearing what the people back home have to say. When President Trump, pardon Rod McGoyman. Boy, I think it was tough what happened to him. I'll be honest. Uh, you know, I, I don't know him well other than he was on The Apprentice. And Why was he on? Because he was, you know, semi-celebrity. It was good. Actually, it was good having him on. I found him to be, I can only speak for myself, and I didn't know him. I found him to be a very nice guy. Not sophisticated. Um, had a little knowledge of computers and things. You know, we found that out, because, you know, they'd be all sitting around the computer, and he didn't really sort of work the computer. I, we said, what's wrong? And, you know, which is okay. We found him to be very nice. Uh, now, he was under a lot of pressure at that point, so, you know, he's not going to be, perhaps. But, but I think that's an awfully tough sentence he got, you know, that, you know, for what supposedly he did. Uh, because what he did is what politicians do all the time. They make deals. I mean, what did he say? He wanted to be a senator or something, as I remember, right? And you don't think politicians say that every day to other people in their party? You know, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do that, but I got to be taken care of in some way, you know? Well, maybe you'd pardon him? I wouldn't part. I, I don't know enough about it. I mean, you know, you just I haven't heard the name since he left The Apprentice. I just thought he got treated, I just thought it was a very tough sentence. I thought it was a really tough sentence um, for what he did. Look, look, these politicians, look at Hillary. She makes a speech and she does something. Why isn't, why isn't she treated the way Rob Lagojevic was? What she does is much more out there than what Rob Lagojevic did. I mean, frankly, when I read about him, he just sounded stupid more than anything else. You know, I mean, how, how stupid can you be? But it sounded stupid. It was so ridiculous. But, you know, I mean, I think they sent him for how many years, Bruce? 14, 14 and a half. Yeah, 14 and a half years. And yet Hillary's going around making speeches and the husband, and, and there's nothing, and she's canceling emails, and she, she goes around. He was charged at one point with trying to get us, extort the Tribune to get us all fired. Well, that, that's probably why it's in jail. That's, that's why I'm being, hey, that's why I'm being very nice to you. <laughs>Uh, hey, everyone, be sure to like and share uh, us on Facebook at Make Schumer Cry Again or on YouTube. Uh, just please also visit our store here at the bottom to help support us.